My NBC News colleague Garrett Haig is on the ground in Pennsylvania ahead of the former president's rally this afternoon. NBC's Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill with a reaction from Republicans and anti-abortion groups on Mr. Trump's comments. NBC News's Bridget Bowman is with me on set for a look at the polling on these issues. And also with us is Caroline Kitchener. She covers the issue of abortion for The Washington Post. Thanks so much to all of you for being here with me on this big Friday, Garrett. Let's kick it off. This is just stunning, this announcement by former President Trump. It's been about a day since he made those comments to Dasha Burns. Uh, what has the fallout been so far? And politically speaking, uh, what does the campaign think the impact will be? Well, splitting those two issues a little bit, uh, Kristen, I think on the abortion issue, the biggest problem that it creates for Trump is that he's going to get asked about this again and again. His campaign wants to close the book on abortion as an issue. They want to say that it's an issue that should be left to the states and have that be the end of it. But every time Donald Trump makes his position more confusing, not less, it guarantees the press will continue to talk about it and it guarantees he'll continue to be asked about it. Almost any position he takes on the Florida uh, uh, referendum could be defensible, but no position or a confusing position guarantees he has to keep talking about it. On the IVF uh, concept, I think this is something that Republicans will probably support in this day and age. You know, traditional, like Paul Ryan Republicans, I think, would be asking more questions about where the tens of billions of dollars to fund it would come from. That's not been a concern of this version of the Republican Party. I suspect base Republicans will follow Trump on this. My issue with it is, you know, we, like we called it a plan in the open to this show. It's not a plan. It's an idea. There's nothing about how it's paid for. There's nothing about who will actually do this, where the money will come from, or who will be eligible. Same-sex couples, for example. There's going to be a million follow-up questions to this, for which the Trump campaign, as of right now, has no substantive answers. Yeah, Garrett, we're all writing our lists of follow-up questions because there are so many. I take your point on the word plan versus idea. It's a really important distinction because you're right, there are still so many unanswered questions here. Let me ask you about the six-week ban in Florida and that amendment, which would basically overturn it. He didn't say one way or another to Dasha how he would vote. His campaign's trying to do a little bit of damage control. Do you anticipate, Garrett, the campaign will have to put out another clarifying statement about where he stands and, quite frankly, how he's going to vote on this issue? Yeah, look, I mean, this is the problem. I don't think anybody would take a statement from the campaign at face value on this point. I mean, it was only that news conference in Mar-a-Lago, what, less than a month ago, where Donald Trump told reporters in that room, including me, that he was going to reveal how he would vote on that bill in two weeks, on that referendum in two weeks, his favorite time period to stall on. And he hasn't given a clear answer. I think only a clear definitive answer from Donald Trump is going to put this issue behind him because it's clear that he and his campaign are not on the same page about it. That is for sure, Garrett. Great reporting, great talking over the cheering crowds behind you. Thank you so much. Sahil, let me turn to you now because you have some reporting about how anti-abortion rights groups are actually reacting to this news. What do you have? Yeah, that's right, Kristen. Trump has certainly angered some of these anti-abortion groups. Conservatives uh, are mounting a pretty fierce backlash to Trump's comments, some of them saying that uh, Republican voters are going to defect over this, that anti-abortion voters, uh, pro-life voters might end up staying home, that he might have a serious problem on his hands if he doesn't at least clarify what he meant regarding that Florida ballot initiative. Uh, one prominent anti-abortion advocate, the SBA president, Marjorie Dannenfelser, called Trump yesterday, asked him for clarity, and he told her he isn't taking a position. She told him in that private conversation that it's imperative that he clear this up because there's confusion that he may be in support of that Florida abortion rights ballot measure. That's according to a source familiar with that conversation who I spoke to. And Dannenfelser put out this statement. You see this on the screen. She says she spoke to President Trump, uh, that he has not committed to how he's voting on Amendment 4, and that doing so, in her view, would undermine his position uh, you know, against late-term abortion. The issue here isn't so much the six-week ban. There's a debate even within the Republican Party about whether to do six weeks, whether to do 15 weeks. It's that the Florida ballot measure goes much beyond that. It would establish broad protections, including uh, exceptions for a woman's health uh, as determined by her health care providers, which is what is anathema to these conservatives. Yeah, you know, the politics of this is just so fascinating, Sahil. And of course, we know that these anti-abortion uh, groups have frankly been at odds with Mr. Trump over his abortion views in the past. Do you think this could hurt him politically with that part of his base? Or 
does it not ultimately wind up having any impact? Well, it could if he doesn't play his cards right, Kristen. They, they need each other. You know, Trump needs these voters to show up. And the, uh, he is in uncharted waters right now because this is the first election in about half a century where Roe v. Wade is not on the books. Republicans had a good thing going politically when it was on the books. They could continue to push these anti-abortion measures to rally their base, to rally these uh, conservative pro-life voters without any risk of succeeding, without any risk of a backlash from the majority of the country that supports abortion rights. Now, you know, this is real, that they're, they're firing with real bullets and not blanks and they have to figure out how to navigate the need to kind of minimize this backlash from most of the country yeah. that supports abortion rights while keeping their voters uh, you know enthusiastic and engaged and showing up it's a difficult balance that Trump is you know the first president who has to strike because he is the one who as he frequently brags about was able to overturn Roe v Wade after many years and decades of trying yeah, and that's the point that Democrats will not let anyone forget. Sahil, thank you so much for breaking all of that down for us. Carolyn, let me turn to you on the issue of abortion. As we mentioned, 10 different states are actually expected to vote on a, a, an abortion measure. How much uh, diversity is there amongst these different amendments, or do they look quite similar? A lot of them look very similar, and I, you know, I, I've been talking with anti-abortion advocates, especially who are on the ground and who are feeling really down about their prospects. They really think that these measures are going to pass and are really going to reshape what abortion access looks like in this country. Um, Florida is the biggest one that people are paying attention to because the most abortions happen there. It's the you know, third largest state uh, before this latest ban took effect, which uh, ends abortion um, access at six weeks of pregnancy. Um, there were 80,000 abortions that were taking place there every year. So that is the one that all of the advocates are really focused on. So I, I do think that whatever President Trump comes out to say about Florida, um, that, that, that will be a really important thing to watch. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And very quickly, I mean, Florida is not a swing state. Arizona, Nevada are, and amendments protecting access to viability are pretty popular in those states. Based on your own reporting, are you surprised to see numbers that are this high? 73% for yes in Arizona, 75% for yes in Nevada? I'm not surprised at all, Kristen. I mean, I've been talking with a lot of pro-choice Republican women, many of whom are getting out there to try to volunteer and make these things pass. Um, you know, they are staunchly for abortion rights. This is something that they care deeply about. It's a very emotional issue, a very personal issue, but they still say they're voting for Donald Trump despite their support for abortion mm. rights for these measures. And that bottom line point is really the critical one to keep in mind. Bridget, let me turn to you. A majority of Americans say that they support access to abortion. How do you see this playing out? Well, you're right. We've seen in poll after poll after poll that this is popular among a majority of Americans. In a recent poll, 60 percent about supported access to abortion in their state for any reason. That includes about a third of Republicans. And we've seen that again consistently in polling. Uh, but to your to your point, and, you know, it's a real question of whether these ballot initiatives are going to boost turnout, mm. help boost Democrats um, up and down the ballot. Uh, those polls that you mentioned also showed really close races still in Arizona and Nevada, even despite that broad support for those amendments. So we're still looking at really close races here. Yeah. And I mean, Bridget, history tells us part of what we could expect to see, which is that in the midterms, we saw it drive turnout up. And, and in special elections over the past several years, it has had an impact. That's right. We've seen Democrats really capitalize on this issue. In the midterms, for example, according to exit polling, about a quarter of voters said abortion was the most important issue to them. Of that group of voters, three in four supported Democrats, overwhelming numbers for Democrats here. Now, Republicans I've talked to have said this is a problem for them, that they need to not let what happened in the midterms happen again. Or in their view, Democrats were really able to define them on this issue. They want to be more proactive, saying what they support, what they don't support. But it remains to be seen if that's going to land with voters. It really does. And Caroline, I mean, Bridget touches on such an important point, which is that uh, we have seen this really drive and turn out uh, voters and, and really enhance enthusiasm in these key races. 
And Trump has tried to kind of navigate these very tricky waters. And to some extent, he has. Of course, he takes responsibility for overturning Roe v. Wade. And then at the same time, I just interviewed J.D. Vance this weekend. He told me that Trump would veto uh, a federal ban on abortion. Do the mixed messages confuse voters? How do they play with voters? It's fascinating, Kristen. I mean, I have been talking with women who, you know, these, these pro-choice Republican women, they're convinced that many of them that Trump is actually pro-choice. Um, they, you know, and, and I say, well, you know, what about Roe v. Wade? You know, he, that, that wouldn't have happened without the justices that he appointed to the Supreme Court. And they're sort of they tend to, I mean, this is all anecdotal, but the ones that I've spoken to kind of wave that away and mm. say, you know, oh, you know, but, you know, he's this, he's, he's really, you know, doesn't really care about this issue and look at the things that he's saying now. I, I do think that this sort of backpedaling, you know, it, it, it I, I think that, that voters kind of see what they want to see in it. Yeah. Uh, do you think this new announcement on IVF, as Garrett points out, it's more of an idea than a plan because there's so many unanswered questions. Do you think this gains traction? I mean, we, we started to see this fight play out on Capitol Hill earlier this year when a number of Republicans voted against expanding access to IVF. Well, yes, exactly. And, and that included J.D. Vance. Um, I, I think that, you know, we, we have to see this is a very, really early days for this policy being announced. Um, but I, the voters that I've spoken to so far are just a little bit confused. Um, they're, mm. they're not sure. They want to know more. Um, so I think a lot will hang on, you know, the next couple of weeks as they're explaining this policy more. Is it going to hold up? I think voters will be interested and, and will pay attention to that. Well, and Bridget, uh, to that point, I mean, voters broadly favor expanding access and supporting IVF. Trump knows that. That's part of the counter programming that we saw yesterday when he rolled out this policy. Talk about what you see in the numbers there. Yeah, that's right. Like you said, we do see overwhelming support for this among Democrats and Republicans, too, which you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about this? We all agree about this, right? But this is part of the broader case that Democrats are making against Republicans that IVF broader reproductive rights are at risk with Republicans in charge. And, you know, we haven't seen Trump really be able to move the numbers on this issue. You know, he's been saying for mm. months that he supports IVF, he supports exceptions. Uh, but we've seen Harris continue to have a big advantage. It's one of, if not the best issue for her in polls when they're tested on a range of issues. And what's so striking is, of course, she prior to taking over the top of the ticket, really uh, became the person who was most outspoken in the Biden administration on this issue. Bridget Bowman, thank you so much. Caroline, really appreciate it. Thank you for your great reporting. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.